Good morning. It really is a, it's an honor for me to be here uh, among so many people that are, are familiar and, and friends to be here at, at Wesley. I appreciate Dr. Smith the opportunity to, to be here this morning and to share a little bit with y'all. I, I too, like many of y'all, uh, was underneath Bill for a, a number of things and got to read some of that really easy systematic readings that, that he would have you do in his class, but I'm so grateful uh, for the things that, that God taught me through through Bill and through Matt and through uh, Dr. Lumen, uh, just so many folks here have had an impact on my life. And so it really is an honor to be here at Wesley and, and to spend a little time sharing with you this morning. And I think as I start, that one of the things that you should probably know about me is this. I love stories. I, I love compelling stories. And in fact, in our home, if you come at any day, probably, you're going to hear us either reading stories, me telling stories, uh, listening to stories. I mean, that's just kind of who we are as a family. And there's also something else that you should probably know about our household is this. There, there are two ways to tell stories in our house. There's my way of telling stories, and then there's my wife, Lori Lynn's way of telling stories. And they're different. And for those of you all who know Lori Lynn... You know what I'm talking about. For me, I'm fairly dramatic in, in how I tell stories, but I'm accurate in what I tell. <laughs> Lori Lynn, on the other hand, is very dramatic in the way that she tells stories, and she embellishes them in a way that I almost don't recognize them anymore. And, uh, and she gets so wrapped up in them, and, and I'll stop her in the middle of telling a story, and I'm like, that's that's not how it happened, and she says, it is. <laughs> she has so thoroughly convinced herself that that's the way that the story should should unfold that she, I think she began to believe that that's really how the story happened. So here's my promise to you this morning. The story that I'm going to share with you may be dramatic, but it's accurate, okay? And that's my promise to you because I want to make sure that, that what I convey to you this morning is what God wants to convey to you this morning. So I want to share with you a remarkable story. Now it's remarkable not because I'm telling it. It's not remarkable because I'm the one that came up with it. The reason why this story is remarkable is because it's God's story. It's the story that he's writing and has been writing. He is the author. And any time that God is doing a work, it's remarkable. And so I, I don't want you to get lost in just the fact that I may be telling you this this morning. I want you to be lost in the fact of who the author is of this story. And as we walk through this, this process, I think you will see the amazing way that God moves and, and works in the lives of his people. Now, the other thing is this. This is not a story that began a few years ago or 25 years ago or 100 years ago. This is part of the story that God's been writing since the beginning of time. And for me, that causes me to pause and to think about how remarkable that is. Is that what God is doing in my life and through Breakthrough Ministries is a part of the same story. And that is remarkable. And so as you look back over the course of God's history, I wanted to start in a place back in Genesis chapter 22. Uh, and if you've got your Bible, feel free to open up to Genesis chapter 22. And this is a very familiar story uh, to you where Abraham is going to have something very strange and, and a very pivotal point in his life. Something is going to happen that's going to require a lot of him. Of course, we know that in the story of Abraham, he waited a very, very long time to have a child of his own. And as this unfolded in his life, then God asked him to do something that is remarkable, right? And we know what that is. What, what did God ask Abraham to do? This is your participation part. What did God ask Abraham to do? Sacrifice Isaac. Now, I, as, as a dad of three boys, I can't possibly imagine what that must have been like to, to have that request. But nonetheless... Abraham packed up and got ready and traveled with Isaac. Now, 
what I want us to focus on in the story that's familiar to us is in the verses 13 and 14. And this is what it says. Right at the pivotal moment that the knife was about to plunge down, Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The Lord will provide. It's written all over the pages of Scripture. And it's written all over the story that I want to share with you this morning that God's been unfolding in my life. From the beginning of time through the very moment that we sit in right now, the Lord will provide. That is a foundational thing that over the last particularly seven years, God has driven me deep in an understanding of what it means to depend and to trust in Him and to see how He provides. 100% of the time, He provides. And so I hope that as we walk through this together, you'll see that unfold in this story. So I want to focus on a particular chapter of God's story and some of the lines that he's been writing in Breakthrough Ministries. And so I thought the best way to do that would be to give you just a little brief timeline on what Breakthrough Ministries is and where it came from. So going back to 1978, which is actually the year that Breakthrough started, This is where the first few words and lines of Breakthrough Ministries, uh, God started to write them. And in 1978, there were five youth ministers who had been friends in seminary who were at various churches. And they started talking together about a way to bring their student ministries together and to do something uh, somewhat different. Because back in the, the late 70s, there weren't a whole lot of big youth conventions and you know, these gatherings of multiple churches, there just wasn't a whole lot of that going on. So what they were doing was, was fairly new and fresh. Well, these five guys decided, well, let's, let's do something coming off of the Advent season and breaking through into the new year. And so their concept was, let's do this retreat from December the 28th through the 31st. And so that first year in 1978, 60 people showed up for this winter retreat called Breakthrough. It was an exciting time for the ministries and the student ministries. And in fact, if if I'm not mistaken, early, maybe even the first year, Dr. Oswald, I believe you participated in in that event at, at some point, either the first or second year. And so that's where it began. 60 people at a camp in Alabama not thinking anything other than this this will be a neat way to, to maybe kick off the new year. Well, God had lots more to write in this story than 60 people in one retreat because over the course of the time of, of the next few years, it grew to be hundreds and hundreds of students. And by about 1985, it had grown to the point where there were so many people coming, the leadership, the youth ministers that were involved, decided to incorporate it as a nonprofit ministry with the vision that one day it would do more than just have a once-a-year retreat. That was part of the vision, that one day God would provide a place and an opportunity for the ministry to go far beyond this once-a-year retreat. Now, in God's timing, that took another 13 years. Now, I don't, I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes when you know, you feel like God is moving you to do something, He's certainly moving the leadership to do something, then you think it's going to happen immediately, right? That, well, I guess in the next couple of years, we'll Breakthrough will be doing all of these things, and that just was not the case. God had much more writing to do in that retreat over the next 13 years before uh, it was time to move into a different arena for the ministry. So the retreat continued to grow. Now, here's what's really interesting about this story for me. Because in 1980, which was the second year that Breakthrough had been operating, I went as a seventh grade student. It was the first time that I'd gotten to participate with my church at that retreat. 
And it was the first time that God wrote a few words of my story connecting in with Breakthrough's story. And it was at that retreat that I accepted Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. It was at Breakthrough Ministries a few years later that I answered a call to full-time ministry. I remember riding back on the bus with my youth minister, and I said, I know, I know without a shadow of a doubt that God has called me to the ministry. Breakthrough is deep in my heart because at that place and during that time, um, I connected into a truth and reality that I'd never known before that time, really. And so it changed my life. God used Breakthrough Ministries to have a profound impact on my life. And so more lines were written for me. Now, after I finished college and I started in full-time ministry, uh, God led me to seminary and he eventually led me back to Jackson, where I took a position as a student minister at Christ United Methodist Church. Now, at that church, year after year, I had the opportunity to take our students to Breakthrough Ministries to watch God transform their lives at that retreat, to be able to sit on a bus or downstairs and talk with somebody who has just accepted Christ for the first time, or uh, to sit with, I can't even remember how many people now have said, you know what, I believe God is taking me to the mission field. I believe God is leading me to be a pastor or a youth pastor or whatever it may be. And it was remarkable for me to watch God continued to use that ministry that had impacted me to continue to transform lives as I brought students as a youth minister. And so my lines and words that God was writing in my life and breakthrough continued along this parallel path. And I loved it. I loved every minute of it. But I never thought during that time that I would be standing before you today telling you the next part of the story. Because I thought, this is, this is just what I'm doing in student ministry. This is, I, I feel blessed to be able to do it. Uh, but at some point, I may not be doing this anymore. I may be doing something else in ministry. Well, I had no idea that God was about to turn the page in a dramatic way, one that I could not have anticipated. Because in 1999, content with where I was, happy with, being in the ministry that he had called me to at Christ Methodist Church, I wasn't looking to go anywhere. I wasn't looking to make a change. And I think that's where watch out, all right? Because I was very comfortable and content. And this is how God will shake up your world. And and he did it in such an unusual way. In the spring of that year, 1999, my wife, Lori Lynn, her dad came to me And I had not talked to very many people about this, but he knew it just because uh, of just family gatherings and things, that I had always had a passion and a love for camp and retreat ministry and uh, probably because of my experience at Breakthrough as a student and, and those kind of things, I always had this just desire and passion to do that. And so out of the blue, not because of any conversation that we had had specifically, He came to me in March of that year, and he said, listen, I know that this is something that you've always been interested in. Let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you some seed money, and I want you to just see what may happen. He said, you're under no obligation to pay this money back to me. He said, I just want you to see what it would take to do what I know has been in your heart for a long time. I didn't know what to do with that, to be honest with you. I didn't know how to even respond other than, uh, okay. And so I figured as I came back and I talked with Lori Lynn, I said, I guess the only thing I know to do is just pray about this because I I don't even know the first step to take in this direction. And that's what we did. We started to pray. And we prayed and we prayed and asked for God's direction and tried to seek his, his will and plan for what was going to happen with this. And after some time in prayer, the, the first thing that came up was, well, if, if you're going to do a camp and retreat ministry, what's the first thing that you have to have? That's not rhetorical. You can answer it. What's the first thing you have to have? What's that? A place. Absolutely. 
a place. And another new territory for me. Where, where do you even find a place to put a camp? So I talked to my dad and shared with him a little bit what was going on. I said, can you connect me with some people who may have tracts of land or, or at least just start looking? And so over the next number of months, on days off or sometimes late in the day, sometimes super early in the morning, I would connect with these, these folks and they would take me to some of the most awful looking property in Mississippi. <laughs> I'm here to tell you that I have seen it and it's not pretty. All right? They would promise the moon, oh, this is going to be beautiful, you're going to love it, and within 20 seconds I wanted to get in my car and flee. All right? It was just awful. And this happened time after time after time for months. And I started to wonder. I started to have questions. You know, Lord, I, I don't know what you're doing here. But I know it's not these places. And what kept coming back was, I'll let you know. I'll let you know. You just continue on. I will let you know. The Lord will provide. So here's how it happened. I talked to a guy in Hattiesburg named Mark Lewis, who is a, a, a strong Christian man. And I told him at least the initial vision that I felt like God was moving in me and told him what I was looking for. And he said, I tell you what, I know a place. In fact, it's not even on the market. But I know the owner, and he is a strong Christian man, and he would be interested in maybe letting go of that property because of what you're desiring to do. So why don't you get up and meet me at this place at 6.30 in the morning, and we'll take a look around. And of course, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, here we go again. I'm going to get up super early in the morning. I'm going to go out. I'm going to be somewhat disappointed. I mean, I'm just being honest with you. That, that was what was rolling through my head. Okay, God, I'll go do it, but I know what's going to happen. And so I met him at a little country store in Homewood, Mississippi. How many people have ever been to Homewood or Pulaski, Mississippi? I mean, unless you've been to the camp, you know, because of forest, right? Unbelievable. I was like, I didn't even know these towns existed. So I met him at this country store in Homewood, and we drove about three miles and came into this little grass path into this property. And I, and I can only say it like this, that as we, as we drove in and it kind of bent around and, and you came down around a corner, it, there was just a sense that there was something different, that this place somehow was set apart. From all of the other places that I'd ever seen, it was set apart. And I fell in love with it instantly. And we spent the next couple of hours touring around and, and looking at things. I mean, I was already, I was all the way there already. I mean, I didn't even have to look at all the rest of the property. But we took a tour around and, and looked. And after we were done, I got back in my car. I was pretty excited about it, still not knowing, you know, what would happen. And I drove back. I got in that morning to my office. And I sat down, and, and for that day, during that time, I was journaling through uh, a particular type of, of uh, devotional that would give you some scripture, it would give you something to read, and then you, you spent some time journaling about it. And it was just kind of become a regular part of my, my devotional life in the morning. So I sat down and I opened it up, <clears throat> June 25th, 1999. And at the top of the page was a scripture. And I promise you, I'm, I'm not giving you a Lori Lynn story here, all right? <laughs> this is what the scripture said. See, the Lord has shown you the land. Go and possess the land. And I thought, God, if you could just be clear to me. <laughs> if only somehow you could speak. I was, after I picked myself up off the floor... And I got on the phone, I called Lori Lynn, I said, you are not going to believe this. This is what my devotion is about today. See, the Lord has shown you the land, go and possess the land. What do you do with that? Other than to say, okay, I'm a student minister at 
Christ Methodist Church with no idea where to go from here. Uh, And all of a sudden, after months and months of seeing nothing, it's like, boom, the Lord will provide. And provide in a way that I could have never expected. And so the page had turned. And God was about to start writing a whole lot of new lines in my life. A whole lot of new things that were about to happen that was going to be a a journey that I, I couldn't imagine. Now, let me tell you one more aspect of this because as I came off of that powerful uh, time in my office where this, the scripture really spoke, the next couple of months were just kind of, I, I don't know what to do. I, I know I need to pray about this. I, I know that something is happening here, but I really don't know what to do. But the Lord will provide. And so one other time, and I guess maybe God just knew that I needed another, you know, kind of kick in the pants a little bit to get me going, I sat down, and I wrote out four questions. And here were the four questions that I wrote down. I said, number one, is it really time for me to move on from where I've been for the last almost nine years? Because I I had been in the student ministry and in the life of Christ Methodist Church for almost nine years. Is it really time for me to move on? The second question was, Am I supposed to do this by myself? Because it was scary. I didn't have any idea how I would manage something like that. Knew I couldn't manage something like that. Am I supposed to do this by myself? The, The third one is, Lord, you spoke to me about this piece of property. Is this truly where you seek to build a place? And then the last question I had was, what if I just stay where I am? So... The Lord took me to Deuteronomy, which I'm sure is where everybody goes. When you're looking for direction, you open up and think, Deuteronomy, that's where I need to go. But that's where he led me. And again, in a remarkable way that God speaks, and not, again, giving you a Lori Lynn, in the order that I asked the questions, he answered them. So let me show you where the answers came. Deuteronomy chapter 1, the first question is, am I supposed to move on? Verse 6, you have stayed long enough at this mountain. Break camp and advance into the hill country. Okay. My second question was, am I supposed to do this by myself? In verse 9, at that time I said to you, you are too heavy a burden for me to carry alone. And down in verse 13, choose some wise, understanding, and respected men from each of your tribes, and I will set them over you. Okay? The third was about the land, and again, the verse from that day on June 25th, Deuteronomy 121, See, the Lord your God has given you the land. Go up and take possession of it as the Lord, the God of your fathers, told you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. And then the last question was, as if I really needed to ask it at this point, what if I just don't do anything? What if I stay where I am? And as you look at the remainder of chapter 1 and then you look into chapter 2, it talks about the disobedience of the Israelites and what did they end up doing for 40 years? Wandering in the wilderness, in the desert. Now, I don't think there's a desert in Mississippi. Um, Maybe for me it might be 40 years as an Ole Miss fan fan living in Starkville. That that might be it for, for me. But I did not want to spend 40 years, or however long, wandering because of my disobedience. So even though I didn't know how it was going to happen, It was then at that moment in time, September of that year, that I said a definitive yes without knowing even the next step. The Lord will provide. This is what I had to trust and I had to to put the reality of my relationship 
with him in that I could trust him completely. And then he would make a way. And so, let me tell you, uh, just kind of one after another, the ways that the Lord provided. Within about three months, six men said yes to step on as the first official board of directors of Breakthrough Ministries. Six wise, understanding, respected men of faith who said yes to this crazy student youth minister's vision of doing something from, from ground zero. They said yes. We'll stand beside you with this. That's remarkable. And that's the way that God provides. Within the first year after I stepped out of Christ Methodist, which honestly a lot of people thought, what are you doing? You're, you're leaving this ministry. You're leaving the security of, of knowing that you've got a regular paycheck. You're taking your family into this, this thing. You don't know where the money's going to come from. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's what I'm doing. That's what God called me to do. And within about the first, I guess it was after the first years, maybe in, in the 16th month of stepping out, we were one week away from having zero dollars. Nothing. I had to sit down with Lori Lynn and say, I, I really don't know when I'll get another paycheck. I really don't know how we're going to buy groceries. I don't know. And as we sat there and we prayed together, we knew the Lord will provide. About a week later, I got a call out of the blue from somebody who I hadn't even talked to, but who knew kind of what was going on. And he said, listen, I want you to come by my office. I've got a little something for you. I said, okay. So I got my car and I drove by his office and I sat in his office and we talked for a little while and he asked about what was going on. He said, well, I want you to have this. And he handed me a check that would take care of all expenses for a full year. A full year in one gift. Now, I'm not saying that that's always the way that God has done it. It's how he did it at that particular time. The Lord will provide. He does every time. And so we move forward with the planning visioning of this place, this camp and retreat ministry. And more people came on board. It was exciting to see how God was writing more people into the lines of the story and into this chapter of Breakthrough Ministries. Yes, we want to be a part of that. And so the board grew. And as the planning for the camp and retreat kind of got in full gear, which one of the beautiful things about this is that my father's life calling and my life calling came together in this project. He uh, started, owned, and was a senior partner in an architectural engineering firm for 40 years. So all of the design work was able to be done in the planning with my dad. I wouldn't trade that for anything. I got to spend so much time with him in the development of it. It was, it was truly an amazing blessing. And so, after all of this time, in 2003, we broke ground. God had provided and overcome obstacles that, look, I, I could have never even come up with the ways of trying to overcome those obstacles. It wasn't for me to do. He was overcoming it. It was his testimony. It was his story. And every time it happened, we stopped to make sure that the glory was going to the right person because it, it wasn't me. And it wasn't the other people involved, and it wasn't the board of directors. And so after about 10 months of construction, in June of 2004, Timber Creek Camp opened. And we received our first group. And since that time, <clears throat> Timber Creek has grown about 180%. Breakthrough Ministries has been able to expand beyond just the once-year retreat, which we still do. We still run that event. In fact, we celebrate our 29th year of this coming December. But God has expanded the student ministry focus. We've started a new retreat for junior high students over Martin Luther King weekend. About 240 will be there this, this coming January. 
we have a heart and a passion for family ministry. And so Legacy, which is what our family retreat ministry is called, has now resourced uh, hundreds of families. And, and we see that as such a generational thing. Because as we have the opportunity to resource and reach parents, there's another whole generation that's coming to that retreat because they come all together. And so we've got multiple generations within one event that we have an opportunity to reach. This coming March, God has opened the doors for us to do a, a missions outreach to Scott and Smith County. We happen to be in an area that is, is not uh, wealthy counties by any means in Mississippi. In fact, it's, it's kind of where all the, the chicken plants are. Um, so if, if you get in certain areas, you can smell it. But the, the reality is, is that nobody thinks to go into Scott and Smith counties to reach out to people to serve them as the hands and feet of Christ, and to share the gospel. Nobody's really doing that. But God's opened up the opportunity for us to do so. So about 130 students are coming this March, and we're going to fan out into the community. And the camp itself is resourcing groups, not just from Mississippi, but throughout the southeast. We've had groups from Texas, from Florida, from Alabama, from Tennessee. And so what started in 1978 with 60 students and a four-day, three-and-a-half-day, four-day retreat, God has now moved into a 45-plus event calendar that has the opportunity to reach over 5,000 people annually. That is remarkable. And that is the story that God is writing that I happen to feel blessed to be a part of. And he is, he is the author of all things remarkable. He really is. And I have seen over the course of the last seven years what it truly means to understand the Lord will provide. The God who provided for Abraham is the God who provides for Timber Creek Camp, who provides for Wesley Seminary, who provides in the lines and the pages that God is writing in the lives of every person here. That is the one that we look to and that we put our dependency on. That is the truth and reality of who we serve. He will provide. And as I was thinking last night about sharing this, this story this morning, in kind of the beginning of, of Advent, and, and we're getting all of these things going in our, in our home in anticipation of the birth of Christ, I thought, how appropriate that what I'm talking about this morning is the Lord will provide because there is no greater provision than the incarnation. How amazing it is that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so I guess maybe more than anything in telling the story to you all this morning is this. May you discover in maybe a rich and a new way the Lord will provide. As you look forward to the, the celebration of the birth of Christ, will you take maybe a longer pause, more time, more thought into how God has provided through His Son, Jesus Christ? Because that is what our world desperately needs to know. That is what drives us in Breakthrough Ministries. It's what drives us at Timber Creek Camp, even if we're just hosting a group. We see it as an opportunity to share the gospel, to share about Jesus Christ. And so maybe in some small way this morning, this story will encourage you to stop and to pause and to think about how many times in your life that you've seen the reality the Lord will provide. Stop and give thanks for that. He deserves it. Thank you, and, and God bless you for letting me share with you all this morning this story. Uh, I hope you all have a, a wonderful Advent season as you, as you prepare for the birth of Christ. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Yeah.